our office and uh, you know have my two LPs at the back this Georgie there is Melissa out here and I think that when people come to us because of these meetings because of what we do we understand the human body so much better and we are able to give much better advice than we have ever been able to do so because what we are learning from you and what this conference makes us do. So it's a collective effort. So I want you to make sure that I recognize my uh, colleagues uh, who helped me do this. So today I was going to talk about how the human body processes fat and carbohydrates. How do we use when we eat fat what happens to us when we eat carbs what happens to us and there were things that I did not, not did not understand as to what a thoracic duct was and we're going to describe that to you I used to talk about the concept of the health of your fat cells and I didn't understand the health of the fat cells as well as I do now because our fat cells are there to protect the rest of the body. The third thing that I did not understand, plenty of seats here, is something called EPOE. How many of you have heard about EPOE? Oh, excellent. How many of you know if you are EPOE 3 or EPOE 4? Okay, so the people who are EPOE4, and you don't have to raise your hands, <laughs> but if you want, you can. How many are EPOE? Okay, there's one EPOE, there's few EPOE4s. So this talk is especially relevant for people who are EPOE4. But it's also important for people who are EPOE 3 and EPOE 2. So we're going to get into what EPOE means. I will be honest and tell you that even up until a few months ago, I did not understand clearly what EPOE was and what it does to us. All right, so I try to make things interesting. And... Uh, I'm going to come back to this slide at the end. So I'm starting it out as a story. And I didn't know this either. And this has helped me treat patients better. So out here is a normal brain. And here is the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. And in this brain, this is an MRI image that is showing sugar uptake, brain uptake by your brain. Because on a standard American diet, your brain functions on glucose. And you can see that the sugar uptake is very good. In here, the sugar uptake is highly diminished. So there is something called declarative memory. What that means is that if I'm giving you a memory test and I give you 10 different things to remember, 10 names, 10 objects, and if I wait for a few minutes and ask you for recall, how good is your memory? How good is it? And I was surprised to find that if you take a normal person, this is a normal person, and you give them a sugar bolus, you ask them to eat candy or whatever, and you raise their sugar to 150, what do you think happens to their declarative memory? Does it go up, go down? down. It goes up. Because memory is an energy-intensive procedure. It, it takes you energy or fuel to form new memory because it's actually a chemical reaction. Now, if you take an Alzheimer's disease brain to improve their declarative memory, 150 is not enough. You need to increase the sugar to over 200. And since then, I have spoken to diabetic individuals and they tell me that they function and remember better when their sugars are high. Okay, I don't know if any of you have had that experience. So, memory is an energy intensive procedure and it requires fuel, 
the Alzheimer's brain is insulin resistant. And when the brain is insulin resistant, it doesn't take in fuel. So this fundamental concept I did not understand that the brain in Alzheimer's is not functioning well because it cannot take in glucose. And today's task is to find out what that is. So we have to go about in a roundabout way and we got to start out with food. So here is a person who is eating a fat. This is just a fat globule. The fat globule is in the stomach and it comes to the duodenum. And when it comes to the duodenum, the bile salts release, uh, the, the gallbladder re releases bile salts and the duodenum then makes the pancreas empty uh, pancreatic lipase that breaks down the fat. So a fat globule is taken, bile salts, you know, bind to it so that the fat globule is soluble. So in other words, it emulsifies it. And it's only this emulsion. So in other words, this is an emulsion. Here are the bile salts that are emulsifying it. There is fatty acids in it. There is cholesterol in it. And this is our cell that is lining the gut. And it absorbs that. So for you to absorb fat, one of the requirements is to break the fat from triglycerides to fatty acids, number one. Number two is to cover the fatty acids with bile salts so that it is soluble. It's water soluble. And it penetrates the first layer that lines our cells, which is sort of watery. And then it gets absorbed. So here is a single intestinal cell. Here is a micelle. A micelle is basically fat that is covered by bile, bile salts, but it just doesn't have fat. It also has cholesterol, and it has got phospholipids. The short chain fatty acids and sugar and other things don't go through this process. They get absorbed directly. So what happens to this fat that we absorb? So I used to think I knew, but I did not know that the fat that you absorb doesn't go directly to the liver. So here is a particular portion of a single cell, and it's emptying material. This is uh, blood sugar, short-chain fatty acids, protein, into the portal circulation. So what is portal circulation? Portal circulation is that when you absorb food, the food goes directly to the liver it bypasses the rest of your bloodstream. It's going directly to the liver. So sugar goes directly to the liver. Proteins go directly to the liver. But what happens to fat? So what happens to fat is that it gets dumped into something called the thoracic duct. So the thoracic duct is a tube in which the body is collecting all the fat that it has eaten. And what does it do in terms of after taking it? Because the thoracic duct comes in and connects to the systemic circulation. It connects into a vein that is draining into the heart. The reason I'm saying this is because our fat is designed to bypass the liver in the beginning. Why it is designed to do that? So, the fat that we absorb, let me go back a slide. What happens is that after it absorbs, it goes through some internal processes. It gets covered by a protein layer. It gets covered by a layer that makes it dissolve in blood, because blood is watery. And it's called a chylomicron. So the chylomicron is put into the thoracic duct. And when the chylomicron is released into the circulation, right here is another example of the chylomicron, um, what it does is that it first goes to your fat tissue. But I forgot that I had put this slide in. So you are absorbing the fat, and here you're making the chylomicrons. 
But you do another important thing, which I didn't know, and that is that in the lining of your gut, this is a single cell of the lining of the, the gut, you not only make chylomicrons, but you store fat as lipid droplets. So you're storing fat for later export. So you will eat, you will store fat, and it takes several hours for you to export this fat out as chylomicrons. The intestinal cell is also making the good cholesterol, which is called HDL. I just put that up there. It will become important later. So you've eaten the fat. It gets into the systemic circulation. Where does it go first? It goes first to your fat tissue, to your adipose tissue. Why does it go there? Because the body, once it makes a chylomicron, how long do you think a chylomicron lasts in a normal person? Let's say a person is not metabolically unhealthy. How long do you think that that fat molecule lasts in the circulation? Any guesses? So I was surprised the chylomicron lasts 10 minutes. <laughs> in a normal person. It can last several hours, six hours, 12 hours, even longer if somebody is metabolically unhealthy. So what the chylomicron does is that it goes to the fat cells, and in the presence of an enzyme, it is dumping the fat into the fat cells. It breaks down from triglycerides into fatty acids. The fatty acids get taken up by the fat cells. And so the body does not want to keep fat circulating in the bloodstream. It wants to keep the levels low. It also can be used by the muscle cells as fuel. It can also be used by the heart. And after it dumps the fat, it becomes much smaller, and it's called a chylomicron remnant. So it's called CR, chylomicron remnant. So it's shrunk in size. It's gotten rid of all its fat. It has some cholesterol and some fat in it now, and it's called a CR. Now, what happens to the CR? It's still circulating in the bloodstream. So the CR goes to the liver, and it goes to the liver, and here an important thing is happening. The good cholesterol, again, I did not understand what the good cholesterol does, but now I know, I think, that good cholesterol is not important for reverse transport of cholesterol back to the liver. The good cholesterol is important for fat clearance. So if you have high levels of good cholesterol, the good cholesterol donates a molecule, a protein, and that protein is called EPOE. So that's where the EPOE is going to become important. And EPOE comes and binds to this uh, chylomicron remnant that has dumped the fat into the fat cells. It comes and attaches to the liver, and the liver takes this up. So from the formation of the chylomicron to its removal by the liver in a normal person is 10 minutes. So genetically, I think what we were designed is to take up this fat and burn the fat in the mitochondria to ketones. Let me say that again. I think humans were designed to do that. Humans were not designed to burn sugar, because if you have a lot of fat, you will burn them into ketones. So dumping it into the fat cells, becoming a chylomicron remnant, coming to the liver, and then burning in the liver to ketones. OK, so let's say what happens to you when you are young and you are healthy, or even older people like Bill, who exercise a lot, sorry, Bill, have to pick on you. Mm -hmm. And they eat a lot of carbs and they eat a lot of fat. So in a normal person, the liver is capable of burning both the sugar and the fat, and really, it remains healthy. If for some reason the liver cannot burn the fat, what will it do? Store it. store it. So it doesn't want to store it. The reason it doesn't want to store it is because it can mess up liver function. So what it does is it says, maybe 
the body needs it for energy. Maybe there is room in the fat cells to store additional fat, okay? So what it does is that it makes triglycerides, it takes it up as fatty acids, makes triglycerides, and combines it with a protein molecule which is called ApoB, and sends it out into the circulation as a fat-filled globule that is cholesterol poor. That's called VLDL. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so I said that this talk is going to be a little bit about ApoE also. So after delipidation, that means dropping off the fat into the fat cells, the clearance of the skylomicron remnant depends on the type of ApoE you have. So we are born with either ApoE3, which is usually the most common gene, or ApoE4, which is about 15% in the US. So if you're ApoE4, you take up the skylomicron remnant very quickly. So in other words, the liver just basically sucks it up. So here is, uh, I, and by the way, I don't have uh, too many uh, graphs and all that. I made it as simple as possible by creating slides. So here is a chylomicron. It's circulating in the bloodstream. And it goes up and down because your intestines have lipid droplets that are making more and more chylomicrons. So as it is getting delipidated in the fat cells and being used for energy in the muscles, it becomes a chylomicron remnant. And out here is showing who clears the chylomicron remnants the fastest. So the people who are clearing it the fastest are people who are ApoE4. ApoE3 people are clearing it a little better, and ApoE2 are not clearing it at all. So don't get confused by 3, 2, 3, 3, and 3, 4. You get one gene from your father and one from your mother. So 3, 4 is like 4. 4, 4 is probably not the best, at least in the US. So how quickly your liver is taking up fat and cholesterol depends on the type of ApoE you have. If you are ApoE4, the liver is picking up a lot of fat. If you are ApoE3, it's not picking up as much fat. And if you are ApoE2, it's not picking it up well at all. So how are ApoE4 different? The liver takes up a lot more fat and cholesterol in ApoE4 individuals. Because it's taking a lot more cholesterol, it doesn't need any cholesterol from the circulation. And since it doesn't need any cholesterol, it down-regulates the receptor on the liver that picks up cholesterol from the circulation. That's called the LDLR. So what's going to happen to LDL levels in people who are ApoE4? Are they going to be high or low? They're going to be high, right? Because the reason is, is that you have cholesterol. Your LDL is circula circulating in your bloodstream, and the liver is supposed to pick it up. But the liver doesn't want any. The liver says, I have enough cholesterol on my own. Let me downregulate the LDL receptor. So the LDL level goes up since the liver does not need cholesterol to remove from the circulation. We'll get to that a little bit more. So this is what is happening. You are absorbing the chylomicron from the gut. It's getting delipidated, de becoming a chylomicron remnant. Here is an HDL. Uh, I've put a diagrammatic version of it here. The ApoE is bound to the HDL. If the ApoE is type 4, it dissociates from the HDL much quickly and goes into the chylomicron remnant so that the liver picks it up much quicker compared to ApoE3, which is slow, and the slowest is ApoE2. 
So the reason I'm saying this is that EPOE4 individuals should recognize that their design to process and use fat. Okay? So what is the distribution of EPOE throughout the world? So if you go to isolated populations, populations that have not been contaminated by the American diet, the standard American diet, like the Inupiat Indians, like the pygmies, like people in Australia. Now, in that population, the FOE4 is much greater, about 30 to 40 percent. If you come to the Europeans and the U United States, it's about 15 to 20 percent. But if you go to very agricultural societies, like the Mediterranean, like the Chinese, the EPOE levels is low. So what this tells you is that humans are evolving. We are evolving to adapt to the environment that we have been subjected to. EPOE3 is the, considered to be the newer genome. And EPOE2 is not as common, and it has its own limitations. So we are not going to talk about it a lot in this talk. OK, so we went back to the slide. We said that when you absorb the fat, you absorb it through the thoracic duct. It doesn't go to the liver or to the portal circulation. When you absorb carbs, it goes to the liver. So what happens if you eat both a lot of fat and a lot of carbs? That's an important question. What is happening to humans if they eat a lot of fat and a lot of carbs? So this is what happens. Your chylomicron comes in. It keeps trying to put fat into the fat cells. But over time, the fat cells say, hey, you're burning sugar. So the question that comes about is that if your body is given both sugar and fat to burn, what will it burn? Sugar. It'll burn sugar. It'll leave the fat alone. What happens when you eat a lot of carbs to your insulin levels? Does it go up or go down? It goes up. When your insulin levels go up, will you start stuffing the fat cells with fat? Yes, you will. Yes. At some point, and it is different in different individuals, there are people who are heavy, but their fat cells are so healthy that they keep getting heavier without their fat cells getting overstuffed. People like me of Indian background, we, our fat cells are not healthy. As we get heavier, the fat cells do this. They say, no more. We can't take any more. They start dying. And when they start dying, they become inflamed. They attract white blood cells. That is a marker of inflammation. If you're eating a lot of carbs, there is an enzyme that the muscles use, which is called li lipoprotein lipase. But you're not eating carbs, and your insulin level is low, the LPL is active, and the muscle can take fat. But if you're eating a lot of carbs, and your insulin level is high, can the muscles take up the fat to burn? They can't. So the fat cells can't take fat. The muscles can't take fat. The heart cannot burn fat. So what happens is that it's now up to the liver. So the liver is taking up your fat. But in the liver, if you're also eating a lot of carbs, it's burning the carbs. But can it burn the fat? It can't. So what's the liver going to do? Just like we talked about. Sometimes redundancy is important. It's going to take the fat and say, I'm going to try to find if the muscles need it, if the fat cells have room. So it's going to re-export it as a fat-filled molecule called VLDL. So in a person who is burning predominantly carbohydrates and also eating fat, the intestinal cell, the lining of her gut, gets filled with lipid droplets. Our fat cells become overfilled and unhealthy. 
the liver becomes fatty. At this stage, it is irreversible. But if it continues, the liver also becomes cirrhotic or fibrotic, and it would not work. So, so far, we talked about the liver accepting sugar and burning it, right? Yes. But let's say you overwhelm the liver, too. You keep eating carbs. Can the liver continue to burn sugar indefinitely? It can't. The liver becomes insulin resistant. So in other words, even though your sugars are high and even though your insulin is high, your liver cannot burn sugar. It cannot burn fat because in the presence of high insulin, it cannot burn fat either. So this is metabolic mayhem. So I must tell you, today I was talking to Chana. And I have been here, and I keep, keep giving you talks. And sometimes, in order to simplify things, I say things wrong. So my concept of what is insulin resistance has changed dramatically over the last few months. So many years or decades of eating refined carbs, you get insulin resistant. And I didn't understand what that meant. So let me see if I can explain that to you. OK, so this is a situation in which sugar is there. The insulin receptor is functioning well. The sugar gets inside the cells. The cells is where the sugar is needed to make energy. That's it. The cell needs the energy to make function well. I used to think that this paradigm was wrong. The reason I felt this paradigm was wrong is I said that there is plenty of sugar. There is plenty of insulin. And the reason the insulin receptor is not working is because the cell is overstuffed. Your, your cell is overstuffed with nutrients, with sugar. And that's why the insulin receptor is not working. I did not think that there was a problem with the insulin receptor itself. In other words, I had this concept. You know, this concept is wrong. This concept is right. I have promoted this concept, saying that, why do you want to eat carbs? Because your cells are already filled with carbs. In fact, I showed this slide. This is a Japanese strain. <laughs> so during rush hour, the Japanese strain is full. And the, the Japanese strain police wants to clear the, the platform you know, well. So what they do is that even though it is full, they take the passengers and shove them into the train. <laughs> so I used to blame. And, and you know the metaphor is right. But in any way, it's mechanistically wrong. And it's important for us to know why it's mechanistically wrong. And that's why I'll tell you. But that's what modern medicine does. The insulin receptor is not working. And modern medicine says, hey, Let's just give more insulin to make it work. Mm. You just have to make the receptor function well. OK, so this is very straightforward. So don't get bogged down by it. I have a series of slides that's going to explain to you how insulin works in the body and what insulin resistance is. So here is an insulin receptor. So Insulin comes and binds to a receptor. The receptor is on the surface of every cell. So if, imagine this is a cell. The receptor is sitting out here like this. Insulin comes and binds there. And then when it binds, it starts a series of internal reactions. And the internal reactions, what they do is, is that they send a channel to the cell surface so that sugar can get in. So basically, when insulin sits on the insulin receptor, a channel is created so that the cell can take sugar for function. Now, insulin is not just confined to taking in sugar. The functions of insulin and insulin receptor is not just confined to taking in sugar. It takes in sugar, which is glucose uptake, but the sugar that it takes, it converts it into glycogen, which is the storage form of sugar. It makes you store and make fat. It's important for your brain function. 
Now we showed the first slide, right? You increase the sugar, the person can think better. And part of the reason of that is that the insulin is needed to supply sugar to the brain. It does a little bit more than that, and we'll get into that. It also promotes growth, and if this growth is excessive, it can cause cancers. What is insulin receptor and insulin inhibit? What do, when your insulin levels are high, what do they prevent the body from doing? What they prevent the body from doing is making new sugar. We have talked about people who are following a low carb diet, they're not eating any carbs. But is their body making carbs? It is. And it's making because your insulin levels are low and you can make new sugar through gluconeogenesis. When your insulin levels are high, you cannot break down fat. And when your insulin level is high, the body cannot do autophagy. How many of you guys know what autophagy is? Okay, so autophagy is a very important process by which our cell cleans out junk. So in other words, our cell, if you're constantly eating, accumulates protein junk, fat junk. For you to clear that junk out, you need to have low insulin levels, and that's when autophagy is promoted. So this is a slide again showing that insulin is coming and sitting on the insulin receptor. It's activating sugar intake, and it's making gluconeogenesis or glycogen synthesis or making new glycogen through a series of chemical reactions. We don't need to fortunately get into those reactions. But here is the fundamentally important point. What happens when you increase insulin levels? As Americans, do we increase insulin levels on a regular basis? Yes. yes. And how do we do that? By eating, carbs. By, eating carbs. By eating carbs. So when you eat carbs, you increase your insulin level. So let me give you a corollary example. Let's say the opioid crisis in the US is very strong right now. So when the person first takes an opioid drug, you know, takes an opioid, they get a bang-up reaction in pain control because the opioid goes and sits on the opioid receptors in the brain, and their pain control is very good. Now, if they keep taking opioids, the receptors in the brain through which opioid works, does it go down? or it remains the same. It goes down. So what happens is that when they take the same amount of drug, would it cause the same degree of pain relief? No. No. It will not. You need to take higher and higher doses because your opioid receptors are getting what is called down-regulated. In fact, the overdose happens because they cannot figure out how much to take. And sometimes they take so much that it causes respiratory depression, they stop breathing, and they don't make it. So if you increase insulin levels, your insulin receptor also gets down-regulated. That is one concept. I mean, I used to think about insulin resistance, but what I didn't understand is that all you need to make your body less responsive to insulin is to just increase your insulin levels. In fact, have it high constantly. How can you have insulin levels high constantly? So your doctor will go and say, hey, you know, I want you to lose weight, so I want you to have eight small meals every day. <laughs> what does that do to your insulin levels? They're high all the time. In fact, they are cycling back and forth, which is much better. Now, if you have inflammation and other things, it also reduces the activity of your insulin receptor. So sugar is not internalized. The insulin receptor does not function well, so the body makes more insulin to compensate. Why does it make more insulin? Just like a person who has an opioid addiction, 
your cell is now starving. It's starving because there are not enough insulin receptors. It cannot take sugar inside. So here it is giving you different methods through which insulin receptor doesn't work. One is that this is proper signaling. The insulin receptor is sitting, but it cannot signal inside the cell. Another way is that the insulin receptor is removed. It's not present on the outside. And the third way is that it is removed and destroyed. OK? So the, many things can happen. So this was the example. I didn't know which was the cart and the horse. I didn't know which was the chicken and the egg. But now I know that the hyperinsulinemia, which means high insulin level is the horse, and the insulin resistance is the cart. When you have high insulin level, it downgrades your insulin receptor, and it reduces the uptake of sugar by the cells. So instead of thinking of modern diet as being too much for your cells, you should think that the modern diet is actually starving you. So now, this is an important concept. Insulin does a variety of different things. When insulin comes and sits here, it not only internalizes sugar, it not only makes glycogen, but it is also increasing fat synthesis. It's also increasing protein synthesis. It's also causing you to have higher risks of cancers. Unfortunately, if you go into literature, you will find that when you get insulin resistance, your cell is starving. You can't take in sugar. You can't make glycogen. But you still make a lot of fat. That's not good, right? And you still are at risk of cancers. All right. So the important concept I want to get into you is that one of the worst things that can happen to you is what is called hepatic insulin resistance, or liver insulin resistant. So when your liver is insulin resistant because you're eating too much fat and also eating too much carbs, the liver is not able to burn the fat. Despite high sugars and high insulin, the sugar cannot get into the cells of the liver and it cannot burn. That's why the fire from the glucose is much lower. And the liver just turns out and starts spewing out fat into your bloodstream. That can be bad for you. So again, this is saying the insulin resistant liver does the following things. Cannot burn sugar in the mitochondria, which is the energy of the liver. So it exports a lot of sugar into the bloodstream. So I don't know if you've ever heard about things like the liver sugar output. If you are insulin resistant, your liver sugar output is high because the liver cannot use sugar. It is synthesizing, synthesizing and exporting a lot of VLDL, which is basically fat-filled molecules, which is, which is one of the cholesterol molecules, people call it. And our focus should be on the VLDL, not on the LDL. And these molecules just stay in the bloodstream. They cannot be removed because your fat is already filled and your muscles are not responsive. So hepatic insulin resistance is a person who can't use sugar, starts exporting fat. When the liver has insulin resistance, it creates inflammatory mediators. What it does is that it starts making a lot of CRP. How many of you have had your CRP drawn? So your CRP levels go up because the liver is inflamed. In the liver ins insulin resistant state, what happens to the manufacturing of the coagulation molecules by the liver? So in other words, when the liver is inflamed, when it's insulin resistant, it also pours out a lot of factors that make the blood thick. So you are at risk of heart attacks and strokes because of that. So the question to ask is that why individuals with ApoE4 have higher risk of getting hepatic insulin resistant. The reason is that ApoE4 people, their liver takes up a lot of fat. Since it takes up a lot of fat, they're genetically designed to burn fat. 
their biology makes it important for them to clear that fat. And how can you clear that fat? They're designed to do fasting. Exercise is also important in their biology because when you exercise, you create an energy deficit. And they are much less tolerant of the modern diet. And hepatic insulin resistance contributes to an increased risk of heart attacks and strokes in these individuals. So I wanted to circle back and tie the story of EPOE now to the brain, or tie the story of insulin resistance also to the brain. So when you increase the sugar in the normal or in the Alzheimer's brain, you think better. Why is that happening? So I did not know this. The reason it's happening is because when you increase the sugar in the presence of a normal insulin receptor, you internalize more sugar so the brain has more sugar in it to burn so that it can create memory. But that's not the only thing that insulin is doing. And before we think of insulin being bad, I sometimes think that we should have cyclical insulin levels. That means we should have periods in which the insulin goes up. And I think the best way to do that in modern diet is to eat a little protein. Protein also increases your insulin levels. Because why is it important to increase your insulin level? Because when your insulin is increased, a lot of chemical reactions take place in the brain that make you function better. It forms new memory and cognition. So that's an important part. So here it is showing you a normal brain, insulin receptor working in, taking in the sugar inside, but also creating chemical reactions that will increase memory and the plasticity with which your brain works. Out here is a brain cell with the insulin receptor that is down-regulated or internalized. They don't have sugar, and they don't have the insulin to make the proteins and other things that are necessary for memory and cognition. So when your brain is insulin resistant, it is deprived of energy. It cannot clear protein debris. So in other words, protein debris in our brain is called amyloid plaques. And it cannot maintain cell viability. So if you look at a brain of an Alzheimer's disease person, it's actually shrunk in size. It's become smaller. Why has it become smaller? It's become smaller because you can't take any sugar inside the brain. When you can't take sugar, you, can you cannot maintain the viability of the brain. So the brain starts atrophying. So this is the only complicated slide I have, and it's specifically designed for FOE for individuals. So we said, so don't look at the slide for a minute. Look at me so that you don't get bogged down. <laughs> so we said that the reason the brain ages is because proteins clump inside the brain. They're called amyloid. So I used to think that amyloid is all bad. But amyloid precursor protein is necessary for our brain cells to function. So as the brain is using amyloid precursor protein, it makes a smaller molecule, which is called amyloid beta. So when you make amyloid beta, the amyloid beta is cleared by FOE. So in other words, the breakdown product of amyloid is cleared by FOE. So what's showing you here is that here is FOE3, sorry, FOE3 here and FOE4 there. The FOE3 needs to first pick up cholesterol and fat before it can bind to this breakdown product of amyloid. FOE3 seems to be a little better at clearing it because what happens is that it comes and binds to the amyloid. It gets cleared by two receptors into the circulation. The amyloid E4, uh, sorry, the, the uh, FOE4 gets cleared only by one receptor. So if you are insulin resistant, which modern, modern uh, diet would do, and you have FOE4, you are much less likely to clear the protein debris from your brain, and that's why you get Alzheimer's about 10 years earlier. 
So why ApoE4 increases the risks of dementia and amyloid plaques? Amyloid beta is a breakdown product of protein that is important for brain function. ApoE4 is not at, as good at clearing amyloid B or beta as ApoE3 is. Another thing I didn't show you is that ApoE4 in the setting of low energy availability, a brain that does not have sugar does not have enough energy. So the ApoE4 breaks up, and when it breaks up, it binds to amyloid beta and promotes the plaques, uh, the amyloid plaques. So a person on a standard American diet who is ApoE4 will get Alzheimer's about 10 years earlier compared to somebody who is ApoE3. It doesn't start when you are older. Even if you take early childhood, you will see that a standard American diet will show that brain utilization of sugar, brain utilization of sugar is lower in people who are ApoE4. So that's why I think everybody should get their ApoE, uh, what type they have measured, and take adequate precautions. So why is it important to know if you are ApoE4? We went through some of this. The reason is that you were designed more to eat an ancestral diet. You were designed to do fasting. Because fasting is the best way to clear fat, as I will show you. You were designed to be physically more active so that you create an energy deficit. They are more at risk of insulin resistance and unhealthy adipose tissue or fat tissue with the modern diet. They have higher LDL levels, and unfortunately, instead of looking at insulin resistance, and instead of looking at VLDL, what modern medicine is doing is that they focus only on the LDL. Why do they focus on the LDL? Because they have a drug for it. <laughs> they can sell medicines for it. They make $40 billion a year. And you can measure the reduction in LDL, but really there is no good way to reduce insulin resistance. There is no money in it. The way to reduce insulin resistance is the old-fashioned way, through nutrition and through exercise and fasting. People who have ApoE4, if they are in this range, they will have a three to four higher risks of heart disease and 11-fold. Now, one-fold is 100%, or two-fold is 100%. 11-fold is 1100%. 11-fold higher risks of getting Alzheimer's disease. So how can I find out if I'm metabolically healthy? So the way you can find out, and that's what uh, we are doing regularly, is checking the health of your fat cells. If your fat cells are healthy, the fat cells elaborate a hormone called adiponectin level. I don't know if any of you have had that checked. The adiponectin levels are high. How can you find out if you're healthy? Your triglycerides are low. Why are your triglycerides low? Because you put fat in the Because your fat cells are healthy. Right. Yeah. As soon as you eat fat, it gets packed into the fat cells. Why is your HDL high? Because when you're eating fat, the intestines are making HDL for you so that you can clear the fat as long as you're not eating too much carbs and as long as you continue to fast. This is called HOMA IR, which is a measure of how low your insulin is or what level of insulin you need to keep your sugar levels low. Lower HOMA IR means that you are insulin sensitive, that your blood is not thick, and that you have low inflammation markers. So you want to check all of these to see if you're metabolically healthy in addition to checking your ApoE4 or ApoE genotype. Why is an insulin-resistant body and brain hungry in the midst of plenty? You have a lot of sugar in your bloodstream. You have a lot of sugar uh, uh, going into your brain, bathing the circulation around your brain. Why are you hungry? Because you are internally starved. You are internally starved. So. Um, what can I do to prevent insulin resistance? 
So what you want to do is that you want to empty, start in the beginning, you want to empty the fat that is collecting in your gut. So we showed that if you don't fast or if you don't exercise, you will collect fat in your gut. So you want to empty the fat cells. I mean, you want to empty the intestinal cells of fat. You want to empty your fat cells. What's the best way to empty your fat cells? Fasting. Fasting. Low carb diet and exercise. I think in that order. Prevent your liver from becoming insulin resistant. Prevent high insulin levels by not eating too many carbs. Not, not but by not eating too many carbs. Cycle your insulin. So. I'm changing your mind. I always used to say, hey, keep your insulin levels low. Now, I think there are some of you who are on an OMAD diet. Do you know what an OMAD diet is? One meal a day. One meal a day diet. Do you think people who are taking an OMAD diet are their insulin cycling? Yes. They are. Because you eat so much protein that your insulin levels go up. And you should have your insulin levels go up once in a while, because you want to promote the activities in your brain that improve your cognition, that improve your memory. You want to build muscle mass. You want to make new protein. So I think insulin cycling is important. You know, today me and Chana were seeing a patient who was, I think, taking 100 units of insulin, 100 units. A normal body makes probably on a low carb diet makes about 25 units of insulin. He was making, he was taking 100 units of insulin. What do you think his average blood sugar was? Low or high? How much? You are right on the dot. So despite the high insulin, his sugar levels were high. And the reason for that is because he was just taking long-acting insulin. What happens when you take long-acting insulin? It's just totally flat. You don't have the cyclical elevations that you need when you eat food. So the, if the insulin receptors are continually subjected to insulin, they downregulate. So that's the worst. And this is very important. How can you provide an alternative fuel for the brain? If the brain does not have sugar in it, how can you heal the brain? How can you supply an alternate fuel for the brain? You all do it on a regular basis. How do you do that? Keto. You make ketones. When you don't eat carbs, when you do fasting, when you exercise when you're fasting, you make ketones, and the brain can use ketones quite well. So I thought that that was very interesting to me. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's really uh, Yes. Thank you, thank you.